Welcome, everyone. There's a few of you guys just joined. Um, we're about to start in about one minute. So if you haven't already, please put yourself on mute. Thank you. And we've launched a poll. Um, you probably see it on just on your screen there. Feel free to fill it in. It's just a, an icebreaker for us to get a sense of who our audience are. Okay, everyone, uh, Craig, Diane, Dom, we're ready to go. Over to y'all. You're on mute. All right. Hello, everybody. I'm just going to talk slowly here and waste a little bit of time for all of the late geologists to, to come on board. <laughs> um, my name is uh, Craig Hart. I'm the uh, director of the Mineral Deposit Research Unit. And uh, I'd like to welcome everybody here to our second uh, Zoom with MDRU. The first one was a roaring success. and We've had very good feedback. And um, so we are planning to have a whole um, program throughout um, the next several months, perhaps. And uh, this is number two. And uh, we just really wanted to use this opportunity to uh, bring some of our strengths forward and some of the good people that we have working at MJRU and provide some insights in terms of what their research uh, expertises are and what sort of uh, avenues they've been going down in terms of skill development. And we're really fortunate today to have a, our program called Geologists Using Geophysicists, Using Geophysics. Now, if you thought this was a geophysics for geologists, you're, you're probably going to be a little bit disappointed. We're really talking about uh, approaches that geologists can be using and should be using uh, in the modern era of, of geophysics. It's, uh, things are developing very quickly. There's new softwares. There's new techniques. The, it's a data-rich space. And geologists are a little bit intimidated in moving into that space and using some of these tools and using some of the data. But um, Diane and uh, Dominic are going to be talking today about some of the, the tricks and uh, perspectives and approaches that, that, that they use and that we use in trying to get better interpretations um, out of geophysical data. Um, there's going to be two parts today, and Diane might uh, talk about this later, is that there's going to be sort of a, a semi-formal presentation of uh, background information, and then we're going to go in to discuss uh, some tools that, that we've built afterwards. Um, as Jean has indicated from uh, in, the, in the chat, um, we are very welcoming to any questions you might have. Just put them onto the chat and we will be monitoring that. And then when we think there's a good time, a good break, or we have several people interested in one feature, then we'll, we'll interrupt that, uh, uh, interrupt the presentation to bring those questions in. So we can be chatty here. And uh, so really a big part of this is about learning and to try and get insights. It's not the formal presentation, it's the opportunity to, to extract value and some other dimensionality uh, from this. Okay. Um, the two people we have today, it's the Di and Dom show. Uh, Diane did her PhD at, uh, at, at UBC as part of an MGRU GIF. Uh, GIF is the, um, is the Geophysical Inversion Facility, Doug Goldenberg's group at UBC. And uh, she, her PhD focused on rock properties and geophysical inversions in orogenic gold settings in the Abitibi. Uh, she followed it up with a postdoc looking at the porphyry geophysics and physical properties with MDRU. And then after that, she worked in industry for six years, mostly as a consultant for Amira Geosciences. Uh, she recently joined MDRU in 2018 as a research associate, and she's working on a, a project funded by Geoscience BC, evaluating some of the geophysical components in the central interior copper uh, belt north of or around uh, Prince George. And she hosts the newly created MDRU video series, Rock Talk Rocks, and uh, you can check that out um, on our YouTube channel. Uh, Dominique has been part of the, the GIF team as well for a number of years, and he completed uh, his uh, PhD, uh, tackling some uh, particularly challenging aspects of inversion geophysics. He finished in 2019, and he returned to, to Mira as a scientific programmer in their Vancouver office. His work mostly focuses on the integration of open source software uh, to the geoscientific toolbox. 
Uh, importantly, in 2018, they both worked together on a new collaborative initiative between MJU and GIF to develop a set of easily accessible geophysical tools and workflows for use by exploration uh, geologists, and, uh, and they will be uh, discussing some of those later on today. Okay. Uh, the last thing I just want to mention to everybody is that uh, we are recording. We're, we're hopeful that there are some nuggets of, uh, of insight and wisdom that come through today, and we'll probably uh, work to try and extract some of those nuggets for a little standalone video later on. So um, uh, just, just for your awareness. Okay, so let's kick it off. Uh, Diane, take it away. Sure. Thanks, Gene. Thanks, Craig. <clears throat> And uh, I want to extend a big thanks to Dom for joining us as well, because, I mean, you know, Craig, that um, Dom has been a pretty invaluable resource to us at MDRU over the last while. Um, he's somebody that, like us, is, is actively trying to bridge the gap between geology and geophysics. He's interested in that. And as we are, and um, we've been lucky also to just be be linked with the with Doug Oldenburg's geophysical inversion facility group for many years now, doing several projects with them and and um, having their help in interpreting our helping us interpret our geophysical data and and um, helping us solve our geophysical problems as exploration geologists. So we've been lucky to have these links and. And Dom is our, our current link. Like Craig said, we, he and I worked together on a project in 2018 to build the, the geophysical toolkit for geologists. And recently we've been working on um, a couple of geoscience BC projects. And um, we're really like hanging on to Dom for dear life right now. <laughs> and uh, we're, you know, we, we look forward to more collaborations with geophysicists because we just, we really value that. Um, that input. So um, I'm going to share my screen. <clears throat> yes. With my presentation, geologists using geophysics for the greater good. <clears throat> So as Craig also mentioned, this is broken into two parts. The first is just sort of, um, it's the more presentation um, side part of the presentation. And it discusses areas where geologists can contribute to, um, to, geo to geophysics, to interpreting and, uh, and collecting geophysical data. So that's broken into three parts and some three different areas where, where geologists, I'm a geologist, so I might say where, where we uh, can contribute. Um, and those areas are building physical rock property knowledge. We can also contribute to geophysical exploration planning and data integ integration and interpretation. And then the second, element of the presentation today is a, a short demo of our toolkit that we built, the Geophysical Toolkit for Geologists. And we, we call it to the toolkit for short. And, um, and we say for geologists, but for geophysicists and whoever, actually it's just a, a handy, handy set of apps for anybody that's interested in working with, with geophysical data and getting some, making some quick maps. So first of all, I'm gonna begin by discussing these areas where geologists can contribute to um, interpreting and, and collecting geophysical data. First of all, um, we're specifically talking about mineral exploration here, but obviously you know, geophysics is really important as well for understanding geology. So, I mean, if you've got a geological um, problem or, or a mapping problem, it, you, we can use geophysics to to um, unravel possibly some geology in areas where we might not have uh, the exposure. So most of us know geophysical methods are very regularly used in mineral exploration. 
it lets ge explorers see geology at depth and below cover over large areas. So it's a great resource for us. And we will get the most value from geophysical data when the geologists work together with geophysicists to collect and interpret it. And it's funny that um, Sergio just pointed out our poll there was how do you deal with geophysical data? Myself, uh, with uh, my, our team of geophysicists within our organization or a co uh, co contractor and Sergio said, we deal with it as a team. <laughs> this is what this presentation is all about. And we didn't include that in the poll. And he is completely right. Uh, and I write this right here. We get the most value from geophysical data when we, we, when we work with the data together. And on the bottom of the screen here is just um, a little a couple of images from my PhD, which is a while ago now in 2009, and where I use magnetic data and, and IP, induced polarization data and models to do some targeting in, a, in an orogenic gold uh, environment. So in, in order to complete a, a, um, an exercise like that, you know, we need, we need the geologist who understands what kind of, um, uh, what do the rocks look like and what are their, their properties in, a, in an orogenic goal setting. And then we need the geophysics and, and, to, and to interpret that based on this knowledge that, that we have. So we need, we need geologists and the geophysicists to make that kind of thing happen. How can geologists contribute? So I, I, I love this picture and this is from also from quite a while ago from 20, around 2010. And I don't, I don't know if Thomas Bissick is on there, but he and I were up in um, the Mount Milligan area doing some sampling. And, uh, and we borrowed Doug Oldenburg's Max Min uh, instrument for, for collecting electromagnetic data. And uh, we were just being totally ridiculous with this thing, just like going through all these crazy alder bushes and, and just collecting some information about the, the overburden in the area to bring back to Doug and his team. So this was kind of funny. We were just kind of, it was a little bit embarrassing to share pictures like this, but, but so this is a geologist doing geophysics, literally. But how can we as geologists better prepare for collecting geophysical data? How can we be more confident in interpreting geophysical data? And how can we actively participate in geophysical data modeling? And so the, the very first, um, answer to all of all of these questions is rock properties so as geologists we know rocks and minerals and it so happens that rocks and minerals are the primary controls on physical rock properties and physical rock properties are what geophysical surveys respond to so there it is there's the link between geology and geophysics physical rock properties um, we need physical rock properties to plan our geophysical programs, to interpret our geophysical data, to constrain our geophysical models. Um, and this is something that geologists can bring to the table, our understanding of rocks and minerals and, and rock textures and mineral distribution. Um, and then just on the side here, I just want to uh, point out so we've got some pictures of rocks and some physical property data and then on the bottom this is a, a um, an inversion that was done a geophysical inversion that was done by um, Doug Oldenburg and his team uh, a while ago again as well in the Mount Milligan area showing the magnetic susceptibility of this of the subsurface at Mount Milligan and this was generated from magnetic data. So I'm just gonna, for those who may not be familiar with geophysical inversion, what that is, is um, generating a model of the earth that predicts, is able to predict that geophysical data that was collected. So a, a susceptibility model in this case that is able to predict the magnetic data that was collected or reproduce that magnetic data. So. Physical properties are really important in two ways when it comes to geophysical inversions. And I'm gonna let Dom talk about this a little bit in a, in a minute. But um, so when we, when we invert our geophysical data, for example, when we invert our magnetic data and come up with a magnetic susceptibility model that can 
produce that data. So magnetic susceptibility model, mag magnetic susceptibility is a, is a physical property. So in order to interpret our inversion models, which are rock property models, we need to understand rock properties. So the other place where rock properties comes in with inversion is constraining geophysical inversion models. So often we do geophysical inversions where we generate these 3D, 2D, 3D rock property models of the earth. And often we do this an unconstrained um, inversions to begin with. And they're kind of more um, smooth models. And eventually we, we move towards constraining these models. So adding information to, to these models, constraining the geophysical models in order to get a more um, um, geologically realistic um, result. So for constraining geophysical models, we need rock properties. So we need to tell the, the problem, you know, these are some of the, the ranges of rock properties that we understand to exist for the rocks in our, in our um, target areas. And we can input that information and then we can get improved in geophysical inversion models. Rock prop so rock properties important in various aspects of um, mineral exploration. So geologists can bring rock properties to the table. So what are several sources of rock property data? We can start at the top. We've got sort of very general sources of information down to more um, specific, site-specific information. So we can go to textbooks and look for information about rock properties. Um, and obviously, this might be um, more general information. Um, we can go to papers articles that have been written um, where uh, they discuss rock properties or maybe rock properties in specific um, study areas. And so we can look for areas that are similar to the um, sites that we're working in, similar to our exploration properties, and try to find examples of rock property data from similar in geologic settings. We also have the Canadian Rock Physical Property Database. And um, that's being compiled at the Geological Survey of Canada um, by Randy Enkin. And they have many, many data in this data set. And you can, you go, you can go to the GSE or NRCAN to, to get this data, database. And um, obviously, you can collect and measure your own data. This is, this is the ultimate... Uh, the ultimate solution here because you're actually sampling the specific rocks that you are going to be working in. Sometimes that might be hard if you don't have any exposure, if there's a lot of overburden, obviously you're, that's a difficult situation. Um, so you might have to rely on a rock property information from similar districts. But if, if there's outcrop or drill core, um, you have a a possibility right there of collecting um, your own rock property data and getting a sense of what the general rock properties are for the rocks that you are going to be specifically working in. So I'm, I keep talking about rock properties here. So for those of you that may not have looked at rock property data or collected it before, um, some examples of rock properties are magnetic susceptibility. I've already been mentioning that. Um, density, conductivity and resistivity, and chargeability. And like I said before, geology and minerals control the properties of the rock. And I just listed here some of the main controls on these, these specific examples. So. Magnetic susceptibility, the main controls on magnetic susceptibility and the magnetic susceptibility of rocks is the abundance, distribution, grain size, and texture of magnetic minerals. And usually, these mag the, magnet the most abundant magnetic mineral is magnetite. You can also get magnetic peritite. For density, the main controls on density are mineralogy, dense versus less dense mineral abundances in the rock. Um, also, the texture and porosity of the rocks is, is an important control on density. 
So if we have a lot of porosity or permeability in the rock, the density of the rocks decrease. Conductivity, resistivity, um, they're the inverse of one another. So um, the con main controls on, on conductivity and resistivity, they, they vary depending on scale. So we, when, when we're doing geophysical exploration and we're collecting um, electric or electromagnetic data, commonly we're collecting that to look for conductive bodies, for example, sulfides. And, um, and sulfides are a control on conductivity, but not the only control. So the other controls are um, porosity again and fluids in the rock. So at a, at a hand sample scale, th there's a big difference in, sometimes in measurements of conductivity at a hand sample ver versus a sort of a possibly outcrop or a larger scale. So you, we might not see the porosity and textures um, that have to do with fractures and faulting at a hand sample scale. So rocks, when you take measurements at the hand sample versus outcrop scale, you might expect it a difference in, in, in rock properties. Um, so this is just something to be aware of, but, but these, are the main, these are the main controls. And so minerals and porosity and texture of the, of the rocks control conductivity and resistivity. Finally, chargeability um, is usually controlled by um, disseminated sulfides or clays within the rock. So particles that can um, lead to a buildup of charge on their, on their surfaces. So, um, Diane, yeah, uh, there's a question that came in that might be uh, worth considering as well. We're, we're mostly talking about rocks here, but um, part of the response you could get from a geophysical survey could be coming from the overburden. And the question is, you know, what about um, this type of information for things like soils? And I'm gonna take it further and say, uh, regolith or um, or glacial or glacial tills. Yeah, so um, this is it's a great question, and it's actually the project that I'm working on right now with Geoscience BC. We're looking in an area where there's a lot of overburden, and in fact, we're using electromagnetic data to identify where we have overburden because it's conductive, and so those kinds of geophysical data sets can be difficult to inter interpret when you have a lot of overburden, especially if the overburden is conductive. So if you have an understanding that that, and maybe this is, maybe this is um, information that you can uncover if, you've, um, if you're doing sort of an exploratory data analysis and, and, and um, layering your electromagnetic data with your geology and with any information about surficial rocks. Um, and this is exactly what we're doing with this project to kind of confirm to ourselves, okay, a lot of this conductivity is, is associated with overburden, correlates with overburden. Then there's, there's possibilities of um, trying to sort of remove that, that layer before you start interpreting um, geology from that, from that data. And one, an important thing to do with electromagnetic data is, is inverted actually, so that you can actually get a 2D or a 3D sense of, of, um, of thicknesses of, of overburden and conductive layers. Um, so yeah, I guess, like when we went into the field, like that picture of uh, Thomas Bissig and the EM, we actually, that was, that was actually going into the field to collect information about the overburden. And we were trying to figure out what was the, what was the conductivity of the, of the overburden. And then with that information, we can begin to understand if, if we're, that's what we're, if we're dealing with conductive overburden, if that's something we have to remove from our data or, or account for in our data. As far as I know, I, I'm, I'm not a lab person, but uh, I think it, the difficulty is just in measuring those physical properties on something that is not, you know, a hard rock or something that it will, if you take it out of the field, it will change its property so much. So I think that might be the, the hard part, but yeah, definitely. I think uh, it, it, any geophysicist will tell you that the, the top, you know, 10, 20 meters is really important 
because that's the that's the piece of earth that is closest to your to your survey so it will have huge influence and um and we don't usually know too much about it <laughs> unfortunately yeah, i find a lot of times just having a map of surficial materials is a pretty good indicator because if you know uh, if you're interpreting your geophysics you know some uh conductivity anomalies that could just be associated with a lot of shallow uh swampy uh, or organic rich um, swamps or something so i think just having that surficial materials map is also a good layer to have in interpretations. Yes, not always available, but, um, but in BC they have some good maps. The distribution of surficial materials. All right, good. Continue on. Um, so I, I was going to ask, actually, this was going to be a point where I was going to ask Dom to maybe weigh in a bit on um, what the value of physical properties is to to him as a geophysicist modeling geophysical data and um and as a as a um a consulting organization that that um works with clients mostly ge geologists that are bringing their geophysical data to them um i wanted to ask what how important is it to you to have rock property information and also how common is it for clients to bring you that information well, i think you i think you said it pretty well right i mean uh, this is the point of connection between what what geologists would look at a rock and and, ex, and tell you what it is and what what's in it versus what's in the uh, what the geophysical inversion is gonna is gonna give you an answer right that so the physical property is is that is that time point um, and basically, if you if you just run an unconstrained version and you just look at it, you might be able to see some structures, maybe some dips. Uh, but if you're flying completely blind, uh, there's really limited things that the things that you can you can say, right? Uh, but if you can pinpoint certain areas, even if it's like very sporadic, if you can say, uh, I'm expecting my sandstone to be in that range of density against against uh, I don't know an intrusive unit that has a higher density or something. This is already kind of putting flesh, uh, flesh on the bone. It's actually a pretty, I just thought about it. We're using this, this analogy very often, right? In geophysics with the medical imaging. Uh, doctors, doctors they, when they look at a CAT scanner, the slice of a human body, they like to be able to say, this is a bone, this is flesh, you know, this is blood or, or whatnot. Um, we're facing an even harder problem for in, in our sciences because there's there's no there is no piece of earth that's the same. So if you want to be able to say what you're looking at, you need physical properties, basically. Yeah. Does that answer the question? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I, so how about how about how often do you see that that data and, and what form does it come in? Do people um do you commonly see borehole geophysical data or um, uh, de core data, you know, collect data collected from drill core or hand samples? Do you see, how frequently do you, do you see geophys uh, physical property data? Um, well, I'm, I'm not uh, as much in the, in the consulting, uh, consulting group as, uh, as, I, as I should, but to answer that question, but uh, I think the legacy legacy data were mostly surface surface samples, but now the industry is really um, ramping up to just take you know all the multi physics on on the cores, um, and sometimes clients they they do have it and they don't they don't even know. Sometimes they have old four three one zero one reports that are that are sitting on their on their hard drive somewhere and. Uh, the, the more they can bring to the table, the better it is. And the most multi-physics too, right? Not just susceptibility, but density is crucial. Uh, even electric properties, although those are, are more rare, but yeah, as much multi-physics as possible is, is the best for, for interpretation. So that's pretty much what it is. I think it's, I think it's increasing over time. It's definitely the, the, word of, the word around town. Like, you know, if you pick up a rock, Grab an XRF or any any uh, handheld receiver if you, if that's all you have, and take a measurement. All right. 
I think the hard part eventually is just uh, leveling all those data sets because you have different sensors, you have different uh, labs, that, and they're going to have a little bit of leveling issue. And you also have scaling, right? You're measuring one rock versus homogenizing things. So, but that's that's part of the work. Uh, it's not it's not a bad problem to have. It's better to face that problem than have nothing. I would I would argue. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I agree. It's, yeah. You mentioned uh, finding old data, and that actually happened to me the other day. I was looking for data from the current project area that I'm working in, and in an old assessment report, sure enough, there were, there were susceptibility data sitting there, and, and I just had to dig a little bit and, and, uh, and found some. So it's pretty valuable information already existing out there. Yeah, that's such a, that's such a big part of the consulting uh, consulting business is just data, bring all the data together in one spot, leveling things if they have to, changing the coordinate system, and then just looking at all of it, you know, all at once. Uh, I think we're, you know, we're, we're humans, we like to see one thing at a time, but uh, when you start stacking all, all what you what you have, uh, sometimes you're, you're learning pretty quickly without even doing any inversions, without even doing like any deep analysis. Just seeing it all sometimes uh, sparks like you know ideas or or like intuitions. Yeah. 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 Thanks. So I ju I just said here and we talked a little bit about that just then. Um, all of these can be measured with a variety of instruments. There's more portable handheld things like uh, susceptibility meters that you can rent or buy. They're not that expensive. And you can just run these along your core. It's very easy or, or on outcrop going around and just collecting measurements from outcrop. Um, you have to be a bit careful of weathering and things like that on the surfaces. Um, and uh, other measurements, and you, I've, I've done density in a lab just with a, a aquarium full of water fish tank and you, you take masses of samples in and out of water and you can calculate densities um, and then other things that are a little bit more complicated there are desktop versions of um, analyzers for electrical properties and this is this is from Randy Enkins petrophysics lab at the GSC a free frequency response analyzer where he measures electrical properties of rocks so there are some there are some outfits that do physical property measurements in the states there's one at the GSC, but that's more research-based um, rock property work. And then, yeah, so there are, there are some, again, and there's also borehole, borehole rock properties um, that can be collected. So there's many different ways to collect this information. Okay, and I'm just gonna point out some of the work that's been done at MDRU. There have been several studies where there have been thorough assessments in different mineral settings. Um, of rock properties, different mineral environments around the world. And, and these were sort of baseline studies that were then used to, um, to help do targeting work or to interpret geophysical data or to constrain geophysical inversions. So three of these projects I listed here, one was the MDRU Geophysical Inversion Facility Project. Um, done starting in 2004, and rock properties were now analyzed in orogenic gold, magmatic nickel, copper, IOCG. I think it may also be MS settings. And um, I did a project with Geoscience BC in 2010, rock properties of porphyry deposits, and then recently the CMIC Footprints Project, NSERC CMIC Footprints Project. They did rock property work in porphyry, gold, and uranium settings. <laughs> So if you were interested in, in looking up any of these projects, you can find information on MDRU's website and links to um, getting some of this information if, you, if you're working in similar environments. So this, we've already kind of summed, summed this up. What is the value of, this is kind of the summary of that, that section, the value of rock properties and a few examples, visual examples here. This was from my porphyry study with Geoscience BC and with Randy Enkin and, and Craig. Um, this image here shows it's essentially a conductivity map 
over the Bell Porphyry deposit in BC. And what it's showing is, so the, the, the samples are divided or color based on alteration. The yellows are phyllic, so a lot of sericite in these samples. And the pinks are potassic alteration, so magnetite, biotite, K feldspar. And it turned out that the potassic altered samples were quite resistant when, when I did the measurements, where Randy did the measurements. The sericite rich, more porous samples in the phyllic zone were um, higher conductivity. So, and then when these were plotted, you could see a, a, an excellent correlation with the conductivity on the map. So this was an example of using the physical property, property data to be able to interpret what's happening in, in the, on the map and being able to come to the conclusion that, okay, phyll phyllic rocks are conductive. So in fact, we can use conductivity to map alteration here, which was extremely interesting to me. Another example of using rock properties was, um, this is, comes from my PhD work, where I built um, a suite of geologic models, basic simple geologic models. And now I did this at the time in, in um, MDR, or, uh, sorry, the UBC GIFs mesh tools. Yeah, and so I built a couple of blocks that represented my geology, some mafic rocks, ultra mafic rocks. There was a fault with a uh, cyanite uh, intrusion in it, and then there's some disseminated sulfide zones. And I, tr I attempted to, um, I, I populated these models with rock property information. So these are the typical chargeabilities of these rocks. These are the typical conductivities. And I created geophysical data and we inverted it to see whether we, could we actually sit, see this, see these targets. And so that's a really important step. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more. Um, modeling and testing, testing targets. Can we actually see what we're hoping to see? It's a really important step and it's a great place for geologists to bring their knowledge. Um, and then this comes from Nick Williams' thesis, uh, PhD thesis, where he took information, this is in the Agnew Waluna Greenstone Belt, and he took rock property information and used it to create a predicted basement geology uh, model. And they're in this case looking for magmatic nickel sulfides in ultramafic. So the purple here represents ultramafic rocks. So th that's a you know taking it to the interpretation stage then, and and um, and being able to use rock properties to to predict a, a geology. So that's really that was really interesting as well. Yeah, I think that Diane physical property data. Yeah, just go back to that to, to Nick's uh, yeah. thing. I, I think that was a really important step. I think it was one of the first synthetic maps that I'd ever seen that was created entirely from geophysics, or and it's entirely predictive, and uh, it's a place where there's uh, almost no outcrop. And so it's amazing that you can get a map that like a geological representation that looks so good based on just uh, an understanding of, of rock property data integrated with um, with the geophysical uh, survey. So. Yeah, I thought that was a real milestone. Yeah, so I, I, need to, I should elaborate on it because um, how it was predicted, obviously. So he, he understood what the properties of the rocks were that, he was, that they were trying to um, look for using geophysical information. They inverted magnetic data to generate a magnetic susceptibility model. They inverted gravity to generate a density model. And that's how that map was, was built. So for every cell in this model, there was a susceptibility and a density value. And then from his understanding of the rock properties of the rocks, he was able to populate each cell with the, the likely rock that was going to be existing in the, at that place. And it comes back to the multi-physics, right? If you only look at again, one, one physical property, you're basically looking at the world in only yellow or only green. You need to have more colors to be able to start seeing, like be able to differentiate between, between units. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so okay, I'm gonna move on to sort of the, the second area where geologists can contribute and um, and again, it's with their knowledge, obviously with their knowledge of 
the target that they're looking for and the geology that that target sits within. So this is an important opportunity to collaborate with your geophysicists that might be going out and collecting or designing that survey, collecting that data. So you sit down together and you define what your target is. Obviously rock properties, what are the properties of the target that you're looking for and the geology that's hosting that target? What are the typical distribution of rocks and structures, textures, um, overburden, depths of targets, shapes and sizes of bodies and zones. Okay, and once we've defined the target, okay, in light of this, now what geophysical methods will apply? And are we looking at direct detection of mineralization or are we using geology to try to vector into mineralization? So direct detection, usually we're talking about massive sulfides when we're doing direct detection, something that's uh, a, a cluster or a body of sulfides that's large enough to be directly detected by a geophysical methods, a geophysical method. <clears throat> um, in other settings, like say for example, orogenic gold or porphyry, we might have more of a disseminated distribution of sulfides. And it's not always easy to directly detect those sulfides unless there's, they're um, in larger masses uh, or bodies. <clears throat> so in those cases, we're often looking at vectors. So we're looking, trying to use geophysics to find vectors to mineralization, structures and host rocks and alteration. <clears throat> What is the scale of exploration we need to consider? <clears throat> and what are the scales of the features we want to see? So on the side here, I just have kind of two different scales represented of exploration. This is, this is the sort of east, uh, west coast of Chile and with a whole bunch of porphyry deposits um, indicated in the circles, in the, in the white circles there. 100 kilometer scale bar there. So this is hundreds of kilometers. And you can see these porphyries sit along the sort of arc parallel structures. And a lot of times people have noted that uh, they are, they're sitting where we have these cross cutting uh, structures that um, structures that cross cut these arc par parallel um, faults. So at this scale, we might, we're probably going to be looking at something using geophysics to find something different than what we might be looking using geophysics for at a, at a more local scale. We're probably using geophysics to find structures, obviously, and, and geology, and rather than direct detection of mineralization or alteration and things like that. And then, so this image here shows, um, it's an alteration map from actually one of these, one of these uh, mineral deposits in Chile. And this is a, there's a one kilometer scale bar. So at this scale, okay, we're, our strategy is gonna be different we might be looking at geophysical data now to look to identify or map alteration zones that are at a one kilometer or 500 meter scale. So scale is a really important thing to just to consider in terms of what methods we're going to use to, um, to collect information and as, as well as, um, um, so a different, different methods may apply at different scales. We might be using more magnetics and gravity at a regional scale, and then coming down to a local scale, we might be using more uh, electrical methods to look directly for sulfides or porosity of the rock. And I just put this here to, for just sort of, to get everybody on the same page of, you know, what are, some of the common geophysical methods. And this is going to sort of feed into the next slide. And again, I, I'm um, a geologist and, and I know sort of, this, this is actually like, this is how I think about geophysics. Stick man <laughs> with <a> cylinder. <laughs> no, no, no. That's not you, Dom. I don't think of you as a stick man with a little brown I never, never gone to the field, so this is different thing than me. <laughs> My hands are too, uh, are too fragile for this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, so it's the, some of the normal methods that we use in exploration. Magnetics, we're looking for magnetic material. Um, bodies that, um, looking for the effect of magnetic bodies on the magnetic, Earth's magnetic field. Gravity, another very common method we're looking for dense material in the earth 
and the effect that that might have on the gravitational field. Electromagnetics were um, inducing a current or we're looking at the effect of natural occurrence, uh, natural currents in the earth and, and measuring the secondary currents that um, result from um, contact with, with conductive bodies. So we're looking for conductive material usually. And electromagnetics will show um, contrast between conductive and resistive material in the earth. So that where we have contacts, geological contacts, and geological um, uh, breaks, it's gonna affect the flow of current within the earth and we can measure that. DC resistivity and induced polarization methods. These are usually ground surveys. Again, we're looking for conductive material with DC resistivity methods. We're in injecting a current into the ground and measuring the voltage in two different areas and looking at the difference in voltage. And again, the geology is gonna determine whether the current is gonna be able to flow or it's gonna be impeded. So that's where we measure the difference in, in voltage from one area to the next. And then to find out more about the conductivity of the earth and the flow of conductivity. And then induced polarization, like I mentioned before, con uh, commonly used to look for disseminated particles, usually sulfides, which are highly chargeable. So charges can build up on these particles when there is a current introduced to the ground. And we can, um, often this, this, these methods, induced polarization is used in porphyry or uh, orogenic gold settings where we do have commonly have um, disseminated sulfides occurring. So those are just kind of the typical methods we see in exploration. And so now I'm going to just go to a slide that talks a bit about what methods are commonly used in specific mineral, uh, mineral settings. This comes from Ford et al. It's from geophysical signatures associated with Canadian ore deposits. And um, you can go there if you, wanna, if you wanna see more and read more about geophysics of mineral deposits in Canada. <clears throat> um, so how this is broken down, the red dots indicate methods that are highly effective in looking for these particular mineral deposits, a particular mineral deposit. Green is moderately effective method and blue is a generally ineffective method to look for that particular style of mineral deposit. And then the different methods are broken down, magnetic, electromagnetic, electric, gravity. And, and then that's further broken down into air and ground methods. And then whether we're looking for the geological framework, so that, like I mentioned, the targeting using geology and structure, or if we're doing direct targeting. There's a lot of information in here, but I just want to put this here as a, as a, as a resource um, people might refer to if they're trying to uh, decide what kind of methods might be useful for the, the um, deposit type they're looking for. And um, we talked about a bit about this yesterday, myself and Dom and Craig. And um, it's interesting, Dom said that he, he had never seen this before. And I wonder, you know, how, how often do um, uh, um, contractors just, are they, are, do they just have enough experience to know what, is, what are the right methods to use in a specific setting? Of course, I would imagine that they would have the experience to know what would be the right thing to apply in a certain setting. But, um, but yeah, if, if you as a geologist want to try to, um, to get involved as well, it might be a good place to look and see. So you can go to the geophysicist and, and, and kind of bring, okay, this is what I understand to be an effective method in this setting and, and sort of kind of bring, bring your information to the table as well with some, some background knowledge of, of what has worked elsewhere. 
Yeah, Diane, I think uh, you're right. We talked about this yesterday and it's coming up on the chat now that, you know, yeah. some people don't agree with this red dot or don't agree with that blue dot. And I think you're right is that every geophysicist or geologist that's got lots of experience would probably put their own uh, levels of effectiveness on, onto a diagram like this. And uh, it comes back to a lot of what you were saying too, is it really depends on the setting, right? Sometimes it's going to depend in terms of whether you actually have rock near the surface or maybe you have to go through 30 meters of regular you know, in terms of whether that method's going to work or not. So I think there's there's probably a lot of variability. This might be a starting point, but there's a lot of variability that's going to depend on on scale and setting. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think take this with a grain of salt, right? Yeah, sure. And, and people are probably eyeballing in porphyry copper because that's a common target in BC. And that's what I kind of eyeballed into when I first saw this. And, um, you know, magnetics are very commonly used to look for porphyry copper deposit, whether that's looking for magnetic intrusives or magnetite associated with potastic alteration. So that's used commonly in that setting. But then when you get to the electromagnetic, it says, you know, generally, maybe, it's, maybe this is blue because it's not actually that commonly used in porphyry settings. But I, would, I believe that electromagnetics are useful in porphyry exploration and that can, they can um, be used to define um, resistive intrusive um the hosts for porphyries and they can be electromagnetics can be used to identify structures um in a geological it can it can sort of help resolve the geologic setting and even in some cases it can resolve the sulfides the sulfides if you have if you have enough sulfides like at mount milligan i think that um electric methods worked uh, to find some more conductive zones where there, where there were quite a abundant sulfides. So it depends on how much, how many sulfides you have, if they're connected and, uh, or, or disseminated, whether electrical methods will work to directly detect them. But yeah, so I, I would say, you know, some of these things are, I, maybe I would look at this in terms of what has been most commonly used, like back in 2007, I don't think probably EM was not being used that, that regularly in porphyry exploration. I think that's a, in, the use of it is increasing in porphyry exploration. Yep, I yeah, think you're absolutely right. The systems right. change too, right? Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead, Dom. No, I was just saying. Also, the the systems keep keep on changing. You know, to be able to target different different depths, different frequencies, and whatnot. So I I think you're probably right. This is there's probably a, there's definitely a bias in the in the mid range here for more boot, and it might just be because of uh, industry was you know more used to use the potential fields to do to do their their exploration work, but. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, and the chat's going wild here, right? Because everyone's got their <laughs> examples and uh, ways that they would do it differently and the successes that they've got. And, uh, you know, people have indicating that actually downhole is a whole other way to look at these things. So downhole EM will give you a whole bunch more information. Uh, a lot of those EM methods as well are going to give you that structure. Uh, a component that a lot of times you really don't understand going in. So this is looking at ores, but really I think most geophysicists today recognize that it's the container that hosts the ore system that is really important. So you need to know where the faults are. And um, so th there's a lot more to it. And, um, and Sergio naturally has brought up his concerns with anisotropy and uh, he's given a nice little <laughs> paragraph in the chat on, on why that's important. So yeah, I think, um, I think it's great that we, we've lit up uh, the opportunity for everyone to um, bring in their own insights. Yeah, let's let's capture that chat and we can we should just post the transcript of it and <laughs> for people to refer to on our discussion group on MDRU. Yeah, that would and, solve a big discussion. And then, yeah, and then Todd saying, uh, you know, rather than relying on on choosing geophysic types for your specific deposit type, you know, confirm the decision. The idea is based on setting, geology, geometry, rock properties, etc. So you're right. It is. It's very dependent on the on the setting. I think is is the messaging yeah. there. Yeah, maybe maybe the message here is we shouldn't rely necessarily on this sort of this generalization. You just wanted to stoke uh, controversy. I, I know yeah. how you work. It's fun. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I, I'm actually going to ask Dom to say a little bit about um, about this. So this is I want to I want to discuss a little bit about testing our hypotheses, our geologic hypotheses. I'm sorry, I keep trying to click this the the um, zoom thing away here. Um, yeah, and 
and how I'm, so it's going back a bit to, oh, can you hear me? Okay. Um, going back to testing and, and, and synthetic modeling and, and testing whether or not we can see our targets. And uh, like, I believe it's a very important and valuable step in our exploration pro process. If we're using geophysics for exploration, we test our, our expected targets. Are we going to be able to see something at a certain depth, a certain size, shape, with a certain uh, with certain physical properties? So um, we just included this slide here, and I think it, this is from your PhD. Is it Dom? No, it was a uh, it was a, a presentation that we we had done at, at the um, BCGS, the BC Geophysical Society. Uh, using the open source tools. Basically, the idea with that slide is just that um, this is something that uh, Doug at UBC has been preach, preaching for years, right? Is that um, we have the numerical tools to kind of uh, forecast what the, what, the, uh, what the survey would collect. So for you as a geologist, if you want to make sure that you're spending money, you're spending your money wisely, it's basically free to run those simulations other than time, right, obviously, but uh, the codes are, are out there. There's a lot of tools that are, that are free for you to use and you'll be able to forecast at a time, like what is the size of the anomaly that I'm looking at? Uh, what kind of, you know, line spacing should I need if I'm looking at a target, you know, I don't know. If it's like a 200 meter wide uh, target, how, how wide which my survey should be. Those kind of questions can be answered ahead of time, mostly if you have physical properties, right? Um, so I think if, if, you have, uh, if you have an expert, like let's say Todd, uh, what Todd was just saying is exactly in line with what he was, uh, what he was uh, suggesting is that ask your, ask your, your colleague, your, your fellow geophysicist, and they can run those, those simulations for you at a time. And that will save you a lot of a lot of money and, and efforts. I think. Uh, unfortunately, it's uh, it's kind of underused as far as as far as I know. Um, but uh, it's good practice, definitely good practice. Okay, I'm I'm actually having some technical difficulties. What is on my screen right now? Nothing. Okay, it's back on. It's back on. Okay, I can't. I'm. I've lost my screen. Can I log out and log back in again? Yeah, sounds good. Oh, we'll sorry. Wait for you. Okay. Yeah, this would be a good opportunity for Dom to do a little song and dance now. Yeah, do you want to talk about Stintag, Dom? Yeah, I, I, I guess I could. Uh, I'll, I can I'll share my screen and show you that slide while Diane is uh, is reconnecting. I think her Wi-Fi may have jumped, um, so she's probably going to switch over on the other side. Perhaps there's a few questions that we can answer, or anyone may have a discussion topic. No questions. <laughs> hey, Dom, are you going to show uh, put up a slide? Yes. Can you see my screen right now? No. Uh, no, not yet. I'm just gonna. It says that I'm sharing, but. Uh... There we go. Yep. Okay. This Perfect. is uh, this is Diane. Uh, Diane's next slide. While well, she's she's coming back on, and this is our my little plug for the open source uh, open source uh, Python package called Simpeg and. Uh, many people at UBC and now other universities are collaborating on and this will basically give you the tool to forward model any possible uh, geophysical experiment and so if you would like to do exactly what we're talking about kind of forecast what what the survey could could give you uh, you just contact one of us so you can go online on, on the on the web page or, or get us on slack we have like many many ways for us for you guys to reach us and then we can help you get get set up um, and yeah basically uh, give you give you the chance to uh, to see what geophysics can can give you ahead of time 
and to do inversions as well. Um, so that's it. <laughs> Hopefully Diane joins back. Yeah, Dom, maybe you could just talk a little bit about what the background is to SIMPEG. Yeah, sure. Um, well, this is, as I said, it's coming from uh, uh, Drupal School Inversion Facility. Jeff, um, Doug was, uh, it was, the, um, was the, the chief for, for many, many years, even decades. And uh, coming, coming near, the, near the end of it, uh, basically the idea is that uh, the further we go along technically, the harder it is for both uh, graduate students uh, to collaborate, you know, to advance geophysics uh, as, a, as a field. And it's also way harder for people that are coming outside of geophysics to start using it, using the code, the inversion codes, the four modeling codes and whatnot. And so the idea is to start moving to the open source so that everybody can, can collaborate, can see, can see what's happening under the hood, uh, and to be more basically collaborative in in the advancement of uh, of inversion uh, of inversion codes and then at the same time because it's written in python you can leverage you know uh, all the all the other tools that are uh, available in the, in the uh, open source stack um, and then Diane's going to show you our little contribution uh, near, near the end of the talk right uh, with the uh, with the geoscience toolkit but basically the idea is that we're accumulating the the work and knowledge of all these all these contributors who gave their time uh, to advance the field. And um, yeah, we're giving access, access to it to everyone. So that's, that's kind of the mission of, of SIMPEG, specific to inversion, you should just go inversions. Diane, yeah. you're back. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I knew I had to do the rest of the talk. <laughs> <laughs> no, I did have my backup computer, but um... Uh, uh, I zoom. It was it was Zoom. I blame Zoom. You're all good. Good to go. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dom. So yeah, the I don't know what you said about data integration, but obviously this is this is important. This is what Sergio was talking about. This is a team exercise, and it's and as and as I was mentioning earlier, there's really two two aspects to it. The initial exploratory data analysis where we bring everything we have all the pieces of data we have likely into some GIS software or a light table maybe some of you like light tables and start looking at overlapping data and trying to convince ourselves that there are correlations between certain things that we might be features that we might that might be relevant to us Correlations between data and our targets or targets that other targets that are similar that we know about and So this can be more or less data intense and everybody's talking about machine learning and AI right now And obviously those are important tools in our toolkit so we can do st Investigate statistical correlations, but as I said we can as a, as a first um, pass let's stack the data in GIS and and start looking for relationships between data um, so an integrated the, the other element to integrated analysis is like I was talking about before with DOM So it's a direct integration of data like putting all of your data um, Information onto a single grid where you can start querying information like like Nick Williams did in his PhD. He's got Susceptibility density data on a single grid and then you can start querying and, and checking correlations statistically between things so integrated analyses provide confidence and help validate our interpretation. So another, another thing that I'd like to say about integrating data, you know, especially geophysical data, typically we're going to review that data before we plan our program. And um, I would say, you know, review this data, then bring it into the field when you go into the field. And most people I'm sure do, but you know, it's funny that, um, I, I didn't do that at the times that I've been in the field, not frequently lately, but in the past, I, I 
I think I neglected that to bring the geophysical data into the field that I've, that I've done some interpretations on and then follow up on some of the things that are interesting to you, some of the anomalies. And for me right now, this is really re relevant to the project I'm working on with Geoscience BC because we're looking for mag magnetic anomalies that might represent oxidized intrusions that might be related to porphyries. So my interest is, okay, we've got all of these magnetic anomalies. Are we sure they're all intrusions? So you look at the map, you make some interpretations, go into the field and try to check and see, okay, do you have any evidence that there are other magnetic bodies that might be lighting up the map? And then you can begin to start ruling out things. So yeah, bring your geophysical, start with an interpretation, even if it's very preliminary, bring that into the field and follow gotcha. up. Yeah, I, you know, as a geologist, and I, I don't, I don't have the uh, the skill set to bring and deal with and manipulate geophysics on the fly, particularly when I'm in the field. And so, I do a lot of what I do just in GIS, and then I output it as a PDF, and I bring those PDFs into the field in a in an app called PDF uh, Maps, or a, it's it's an Avenza Map app that uh, is free or was free, and you know, you can it just gives you a. Um, the you know the size of your your screen whether you use it on your phone or on a an iPad or whatever but you can see where you are with respect to the geophysics or whatever layers you put on top of the geophysics it's just a it's just a very um, you know GIS uh, friendly way to carry the geophysical data sets with you when you're in the field yeah that's really cool mm. are a lot of people doing that Craig do you know you know, I think there's a there's a community. Like I know in the Yukon, they put all of their geological maps into uh, they've been all geo referenced and they're all available for download from the Avenza Maps uh, store. And um, and so and whenever we run field trips, we always make a map that is uh, geo referenced that people can have with them on their phone or their iPad or, or tablet or whatever. So yeah, I think you know there are communities where it is. Um, a, a common feature and I think it's it's got so much opportunity particularly just as I said for you know you can take a hundred maps into the field on your tablet as opposed to packing them as paper or trying to get them up on your laptop all the time yeah I just included this slide here this is this is a plug for my current project and that Dom has worked with me on again um, the it's it's part of geoscience bc central interior copper gold research project and this is just this is just an example of sort of some of the preliminary data stacking and information gathering that 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 i went through um at the initial stages of the project to try to um um you know convince myself that there were relationships between things that needed to be follow up on followed up on so um the left image here is this is the study area it's in the quenelle terrain in bc and this is um a, a magnetic inversion slice in the background um regional magnetic data inversion so this is a susceptibility map and on top of that i've got some interpreted structures and interpreted the purple are interpreted magnetic bodies that come from more high resolution magnetic data and arcan magnetic data and so, you know, I was looking at these things initially to see, okay, do we have any correlations between more deep seated mag magnetic bodies, which might mean be representative of um, magmatic centers possibly, and some of the more um, shallow uh, high mag anomalies. So this is, it's just an, ex and, and, and also the structure. So it's an example of just stacking data and looking to see, okay, are we looking for the environment that we understand to be hosting a particular style of mineralization. And then on the right was another interesting thing that started to come out of this work. It's more unraveling the geology in the same area where underneath here we have um, gravity data and the black lines are the, are the existing BC um, geology poly, poly lines. And so you can see, first of all, the gravity in the center of the map here, where, where there's extensive cover. So there's mapping is very difficult, if not impossible here. So we're really relying on geophysics here. You can see the gravity is cross-cutting some of these, um, some of the geology, geologic trends in the center of the map. But this is also corroborated by, see the blue lines here represent re interpreted resistive 
bodies from EM data modeling. So we've got something here in the center of the map where high gravity highs are correlating with resistors. Is this some kind of um, mafic or dense mafic massive uh, volcanic packages or something like that? So these are the things I'm, I'm following up on for that project. But again, an example of stacking data and getting a, integrating data and getting a sense of um, the geologic setting. Uh, Diane, uh, there's a question. What are the contours over the magma? What do they represent? The contours are um, from the NRCAN magnetic data. The and TMI. Then, and, and then the colored grid is a... It's a magnetic grid? susceptibility map, essentially. Right. Okay. Yeah. So it's the magnetic susceptibility of the subsurface. But a, from region, more regional scale data. So this is from the Quest magnetic data set, which was uh, a lower, a bit lower resolution than the than the NRCAN data. So we can see deeper features. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna move forward and and show do a little demo of the app that we built or the apps, the set of okay. apps that we built. Right. But maybe before we go to the second sure. part, we can just. Uh, clear up any, uh, any questions that might be out there and um, I know there was a couple where um, not so much questions well in part I guess but uh, but emphasizing the importance of survey survey design and line spacing and of course that's always a question that comes up in terms of you know what are the preferred line spacings in terms of a lot of this uh, survey acquisition I, I don't know whether either you or Dom want to address that but um, it's a question that that's really been coming up Uh, so the question would be kind of how, how do you figure out which line spacing you yeah, need? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, that that's obviously depends on what your the, the size of the objects you you want to be able to resolve, right? Because uh, the inline data is always going to be very fine, but you're limited by how you know how wide the aperture if you want of your of your survey of your surveys, and that's where the Forward simulation is going to be it's going to be really nice to, to do, because if you're not interested at anything you know I don't know between 50 meters, or below 50 meters, then just for a model a block at 50 meters and you'll know at what depth you're expecting it and what kind of signal you're gonna you're gonna see, uh, and and that way you'll answer right away your question you know if you if, if you only want to grid the data after. Uh, how well can you grip an anomaly of 50 meters wide at 200 meter depth? You know, I don't know. I don't have the right answer for yeah. you, unless you you, you simulate it. <laughs> yeah, and there's another question that's not fair to, to ask you guys either, but but it's come in, and again, everyone will have this uh, question in terms of what is the criteria for reprocessing old data versus actually getting a new survey? You know, does that old data still have value? Um, I think it's definitely worth. Uh, looking and try to to extract it because you might not have to spend more money right if, even if you have to spend a consultant uh, a week of work to, to just try to pull as much out of the old reports and the old hard drives uh, this might save you hundreds of thousands of dollars over buying another survey i don't want to take away work from the, <laughs> from the acquisition cut in this year but it's kind of a shame to throw away all data that could still be used just because they're hard to they are to access right there are lots of tools to uh, to extract information from like color maps and, and and whatnot so it's worth it it's it, it's worth trying at least i would say yeah and uh, there's one other question back when we we're talking about magnetic susceptibility is there any qaqc for magsus data Yeah, I, I try to uh, to answer answer her privately. I I have never done it, so I can't I can't really answer it. But uh, what I would say to this is that uh, the more data you'll have, the more samples you'll have, the more like a statistical representation you'll be able to have. So I would say, hopefully, you can just acquire more, and and you know stack more data so you can you can start building like models, understanding of, of rock types and, and whatnot. But I don't have 
more, much more on that sort of for, for you on that one. Yeah, the, the only two things I would put into that is that um, the first thing you want to do is make sure your magnetic susceptibility meter is calibrated. And I've been in places where, you know, they've got two mag meters going on core. And I say, okay, well, let's go do the same rock. And they're not the same, right? So one of them's not calibrated properly. Which one is it? I don't know, right? And so it's it's the, the first and most obvious problem is, it, is, it, is are the meters calibrated? And I've seen significant differences between a KT9 and an SM20 in terms of the results that they're giving for the same rock. So, um, and then within our KT9s, We've got a whole range of, of different responses as well. So, okay. So I think I think I only are you are you finished? sorry. Yeah, and I just have one other thing yeah, is yeah. that um, a lot of the what we talk about is QAQC is really just natural variability as well. Is that you know within one individual unit you will get two or three different orders of magnitude of magnetic susceptibility responses right and i think we see this very often in things like andesites or uh, granite diorites where you know your your meter will be you'll be getting ones here but you'll be getting hundreds somewhere else but you're mapping it as the same unit or you lithologically you see it as the same unit so um that's not telling you that there's any qaqc problems because you get that variability that's just the way nature is but uh, you know, for at any one outcrop site, we usually like to take take you know ten readings, for example, and then you're going to get a mean. And what does that mean mean? Often the mean doesn't isn't that meaningful because it's actually you're getting values that are probably really representative, and then probably you're getting values that are really low because the rock has been oxidized or weathered or something like that. So the mean is just giving you the representation between the high and the low, and maybe that's sort of what an aircraft would see if you're acquiring a an airborne survey but it's not really representative of the rock as well. So, you know, there, there are variabilities in there that you just need to understand uh, in order to best use the data. And I, we kind of, kind of briefly talked about this yesterday, right? Uh, is that uh, the absolute value of susceptibility of a rock is, is when, when we talk about like, you know, trying to compare this to a geophysical survey and geophysical inversion, the absolute value of susceptibility is probably not as important as just a relative, what is compared to the rock next to it. Uh, this is much more um, uh, easy to integrate in, the, in, in, like a, in knowledge in terms of geophysics, geophysical inversions, because the value in the model will never match the value on the rock, just as you said, because of like variability and homogenization of like, you know, bulk properties and everything. So yeah, uh, and just having yeah. relative is, is much more important. So. Yeah, no, that's good. And Bill Morris just posted a, a, a reference to um, a recent manuscript on the variability of outcrop magnetic susceptibility uh, and its relationship to porphyry copper deposits, which is a really good starting point to understand that. Thanks for that. Uh, all right, good. I think I think we've we've cleared up uh, the, the first part of this, and so um, Diane, uh, maybe you can uh, go forward with the icing on the cake here. Yeah. So I I, I only have looks like I just have about fifteen minutes, so I'll, I'm gonna. Um, this might be a little, you know, we might be underrepresenting what we can do with this toolkit here, but I just want to give you a sense of what's available for people to, to try out. And um, if there's any questions, you know, we'll post the, um, the website for this. If you have any questions, you can, you can email me or Dom. Um, my email is available on the uh, MDRU website. And uh, Dom's contact, I guess we can provide, it's, you can probably find it on the Mirror Geoscience website. If you have any questions about these apps and using them, because we would love people to use them. Um, yeah, so it, we focused on magnetic data, building these apps because it's, they're you know, prolific data sets and they tell us a lot about geology and structure and they're a great place to start for data integration. So um, I'm gonna give this a shot. So it's the geophysical toolkit. Now I might need to uh, share, can I, I need to share my browser, okay? So you're gonna try and take this real time. Real time. Oh, that's always fraught with the... Uh... No, don't worry about it. <laughs> don't worry about it. Okay, you know what, I'm just gonna have to look up um, I don't think I was able to. So you can Google UBC GIF to get there. 
I actually all, often do that, but, um, and into their GeoSci resources. Okay, and this is where you can find SIMPEG as well. And their geophysics for practicing geoscientists uh, page, which has a lot of information about geophysics, geophysical methods, and it's, it's built for geologists and geoscientists that are not geophysicists to learn about geophysics. Okay, we go in here and the toolkit is in here. Toolkit, okay, toolkit.geosci.xyz. Okay, so the toolkit, we've broken it down into four sections. So we've got just background on magnetic data. This comes directly from geo, geo physics for practicing geoscientists, comes from the UBC GIF page that I just mentioned. Um, but paraphrased, and you can link back to that page for more information. So it's just background information on magnetics. Then we've got some case studies, so a synthetic case study and a real life data case study using Geoscience BC's Search 2 data set, magnetic data set. We've got an area where you can work with your own data. And then the last section is just considerations when you're interpreting uh, magnetic data. So I'm gonna just show you quickly the case study section. So I said we have synthetic section and a real life data section. And you can read through this, but um, you can see this is the geophysical data produced from a synthetic model we built. This is the real life search to magnetic data. And on each of these uh, pages, you're linked to a series of apps where you can go in and interact with the synthetic or the real life data. And I'm gonna show you an example so you can see what these apps look like, okay? So in the, for the synthetic modeling, one useful page is the magnetic data visualization page. I'm just gonna quickly show this because I wanna move on to uh, an example using some BC data. But for example, you can come in here these apps are hosted on um, in Jupyter Notebooks, okay? So when we launch this finder, it's gonna spin a little bit and it might take a minute or two, okay? To load up the app. So I'm just gonna go, sorry, I'm just gonna go back for one second while that's spinning, okay? And you, so you, you don't necessarily, Pardon? Oh, it's good to go? Okay. You don't necessarily need to go into the app. You can learn more just by scrolling down through the web page and reading. There's a little bit of information about reading about um, uh, that particular um, topic. So if I go back again to case studies and go into um, visualization and data filters, there's some information if you scroll down on color stretches, um, sun shading, you know, when you might want to apply these things, what they do, filters, what do der derivative filters do to your geophysical data and what are the different filters useful for, okay? And you can go into these apps, which are then, like I said, hosted on the Jupyter Notebooks. And I'm just gonna give you a quick, I'm not really gonna go through this, but how this, the information is here and you can read through, okay, this is a <clears throat> notebook a app regarding visualizing magnetic data. <clears throat> And it just has instructions here, and it tells you what the different toggles uh, and slide bars do. And to run, to run the interactive portion of these apps, you have to click on the, and as Gene said, this is being recorded, so you can go back and look at this later if you need to. But you click on the, on the cell, and you can come up here and press run. So that usually loads libraries, the first one, and then run, and it opens up your interactive um, window where you can change things like color scale <clears throat> and shading and things like that, sun shading. So this is basically the, the case study portion of this page is really useful for seeing, you know, what um, different ways you can look at your magnetic data and different things that you can do with your magnetic data to emphasize features and bodies. It's a good place to learn about um, magnetic data. Okay, 
so that's the case, the two case studies. The second one is with the Geoscience BC search data. It's the same little apps, visualization apps, filter apps, and we also have an edge detection app. So what I really wanna show you quickly is our app where you can load and explore your own data, okay? So you can do this online. Um, when you go on here, it, it recommends you to install this geo toolkit locally to your machine. And there's instructions, but we're, we're working on this. It's, it's been a little bit difficult to be able to make this accessible to, um, to install online with all of the different libraries that are required. So best right now, you can work with this, um, or, sorry, best to work online and, and perhaps right now, um, as we continue to work on the local installation uh, aspect of this, um, just work online and, and there's some options here for um, you to, you can still load your own data, except it's gonna be stored on a cloud. So you might wanna consider um, privacy issues and things like that. But what we've done is made available almost all of the BC geophysical uh, magnetic data sets. Um, I just extracted them from NRCAN website and we placed them in a, a link to a folder. And you can, you can, if you're interested in looking at BC geophysical data, you can pull down that data and start using it in here, okay? So again, like I said before, these gray cells, you need to run these to, to um, load all the libraries that you need and also to, to start up the different widgets. Okay, so we're loading libraries in these first couple of cells. Press run. And again, the instructions are all here for, for the, different, um, the different widgets and parts of the apps um, where you need to enter information. Okay, so I'm just gonna go through and show you this sort of in a concise way as possible what we can do here, okay? So I'm gonna show you where you can right now grab some BC magnetics data and take a quick look at it and export um, maps for yourself. Okay, so this is the, really the beginning of this user, um, user page here. So this is where we've already input a link to the BC geophysical data sets. Okay, you can um, put, your own, put a link here to your own data if you've got your data on a Dropbox or a cloud. Okay, it, can't, it cannot look, if you're on, working online, it cannot look locally on your computer, but if you've got your data in a Dropbox or on a cloud, you can put the link here. Okay, and I'm gonna say download. It's gonna download that folder from the Dropbox. Okay, it's telling us, okay, successfully downloaded. Look in the folder. Okay, now these are all the data sets that we can choose from here. Um, and so I'm just gonna show quickly, because last week we were talking about the two Dagon with Farhad and Rob. Um, I'm gonna choose a two Dagon data set. And so these are all GeoTIFFs, okay? So I'm gonna select GeoTIFF, load the file, load complete, okay. Tells me load is complete. Now I can come down to the next widget and check my data. So here it is. I, I sorry, I, you can do so, uh, shift return, shift enter to run these cells as well. Okay, and you can have a quick look at your data here mainly. And it also gives you the opportunity to reduce to poll. If you have a big data set, you wanna reduce to poll here, it's gonna take a while. So I'm not gonna show that. And to do, reduce to poll, you need your inclination and declination. And it describes that in the, in the notebook. So I'm not gonna describe it here. Okay, so then we can window out data that we're interested in with this next widget, okay? So you can see here, there's a box and we can define our area of interest or data set that we want to uh, look more closely at by just sliding these bars, changing the width. Okay, I'm gonna try to zoom into where um, the area that Farhad and Rob were looking at for um, their, during their discussion last week in the two to gone. Okay. Okay, so this is where we're gonna look. 
This is showing where the, the data that we're windowed into. And now we've got the visualization app here. And you can change, as I mentioned, uh, color, color scales. Okay, you can change the range of data. You, we've got histogram equalized as a default. And now these are sliders that change the transparency of um, the data and the sun shading. So let's say, okay, I'm going to turn off, turn, reduce the, um, the sun shading a little, make it more transparent. You can change the azimuth of the sun shading. Okay, and then I can export that. So I give it a name, let's say it's two. And you can export as a GeoTIFF, okay? And actually you can add contours, which I think is really awesome. But you have to kind of, the way you add contours is you have a starting value, you put the contour interval, and then where you wanna end that, It'll add the contours, okay? And now I'm gonna export that. Okay, it tells me it's exported it. So in order to collect that then, you actually have to go to the cloud. So you go up to this little symbol. Again, this is written in the notebook, so you can follow the, in, the instructions there. And if you right click on it, you can go to the cloud and collect that exported map. Okay, we have to go into the notebooks, so that's where all of these apps are stored, and the output from those notebooks. So if I look for two, okay, I can download that file. Okay. And then I'm just going to go to the next one quickly and show you. This is filters, data filters. You can do all the different derivatives. For example, this one is first vertical. It looks a little bit noisy. You can change the upward continuation, maybe to get rid of a bit of the noise. Okay, again, you can export that. And you can export your contours as shape files. Um, and you can change the, the projection system as well on the output. So you have to look up the EPSG code. So the EPSG code for this data is, was automatically filled in. Say if you wanted to export this to lat long or something, you could Google the EPSG for that and then put it in here and export to a different projection, which is an amazing um, um, tool there. And then we have uh, depth to source estimation, which I'm not gonna really get into, but I just wanna show you. So that data then was, went to my downloads folder. Okay. I'm gonna just go to, um, you can still see my screen. I'm going to go to Google Earth. And I'll just quickly show that because you can bring it into Google Earth because it's a GeoTIFF. Okay, we're going to file, import. We're not seeing your Google Earth. Uh, no, okay. Is it good? Yes. Okay. Grab that Trudagon, okay? Okay, and you can bring it right into Google Earth. You can ch change the transparency of it. And similarly, you can bring that into QGIS are as a located map. And um, I think I'm just gonna end that there because I think the time is up and I hope that you guys can explore this for yourselves and, and come to us and ask any questions that you have. But um, I just, I'm really happy with the things that this tool can do and I use it, I use it regularly because it's just um, fast and easy. I love exporting the contours as shape files and bringing them into ARC. And I, and my, I love to work in the um, tilt, tilt depth estimation. So that's sort of an edge detection. And I export um, the results of that as, as polylines, or you can export it as points and bring it into ARC and get sent a sense of how deep features are and the edges of features. It's, 
I think it's a really great place for geologists to go and learn a bit about magnetic data, what filters do, then be able to export some, import and export some uh, data of their own. Tom, do you have anything you want to add to all that? Uh, well, it looks like uh, the mag is, uh, <laughs> is pretty associated with the topography here. So uh, <laughs> here's a caveat to everyone. <laughs> it's important to look at your mag with respect to, uh, to your topography. <laughs> There is a big yeah. intrusion here, and that's the one that Farhad was discussing last week. I think the Baker, the old Baker deposit or mine is in here somewhere. I was looking closely. I think this might be, might be in this valley somewhere. Oh, it's up here, I think. I don't know. Seems to be where the... Yeah, I've, I've played a little bit of, uh, with the data in this area, and there is some really strong structural control, and the structural control is defining the valleys, and the, the structures themselves have a lot of magnetic destruction along them. And so, yeah, there is this real, like, I believe that the relationship between a lot of the topography and the magnetic responses are, are pretty close to real. It's an X, right? Yeah. But, uh, yeah, Diane, I, I think you're right. We are uh, out of time here, but, you know, the thing, the messaging that I think is really important here is that these are not just um, little kitty tools. These are incredibly, so there's a lot of sophisticated uh, components within here that allows any geologist to easily access the opportunity to, to modify and manipulate geophysical data. And for so long, that's been so intimidating to most geologists because the programs are expensive. It's a big buy-in. There's a, a steep learning curve. But I think with, with this situation, with these apps and the supporting information in the, the notebooks, I think that there really is every opportunity for every geologist to get in there and start getting their, their hands wet or feet wet and hands dirty or whatever. But uh, yeah, I think this is a, this is a great tool. And uh, you know, hopefully, well, we've got uh, 48 participants who are still online, so hopefully there's recognition of the value here. Yeah, I just I included a few resources at the end of this and the Geophysics for Practicing Geoscientists. A couple of references that I, I find excellent for geologists using and interpreting geophysics. This is that Ford reference there. Segment, I didn't mention, but this is a, this is a mailing list for, geo, for um, geophysicists that work in, in exploration, mineral exploration. And I'm, I'm signed up for this and I find this a very informative mailing list to be on with, you know, you don't have to be a geophysicist to be on, on in a group like this. Very interesting topics come up and um, I think it's a great place to sort of glean insight into the geophysicist world. And then SIMPEG as Dom uh, discussed. All right, so there we have it, geologists using geophysics. It's, it's nothing to be intimidated about. You just need a few easy steps and uh, <laughs> you can start generating value and uh, interpreting things yourself. So I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. This has been uh, a Zoom with MDRU.